Do you know what has no thumbs but can cook, clean, and pour you a glass of wine? This thing. It's called the Astribot robot, and it's pretty impressive. Take a look at this demo video, but keep two things in mind. One, the company behind this was founded in December 2022. This thing took one year to develop. But one thing that was kind of shocking, no, stunning, no, surprising. One thing that was surprising is that they're saying it's going to be in your house by 2024, this year. With that in mind, take a look at this demo video. Morning light breaks, I'm still in a haze. My robot butter starts my days. He serves up breakfast with electronic grace. We're living short in this tech embrace. He brushes my teeth, offers up the pace. Cleans up the room, no movement to waste. My robot partner of flawless design Clock to perfect saving precious time So that's pretty impressive. Let's take a look at some of the things that jumped out at me in this video. So number one is there's no teleoperation. Now we've seen robots do some pretty incredible things like cooking a full course meal, but those were teleoperated. So there's a human operator kind of holding the things and training the robot how to do that. And for certain simple tasks, the robots will be able to generalize and kind of figure out how to do it by sort of mimicking how the human controller, the puppeteer, if you will, how they controlled it. Here, as you can see right off the bat, you know, they're spelling it out. So it's 1x speed, no teleoperation. They even got a little timer running there on the laptop. This is funny because there's a lot of people that have in the past had demos that we didn't know what to make of because we didn't know what was real, what wasn't, what was camera tricks versus the reality, etc. The other thing that really jumps out is, first of all, I mean, the object recognition, we've seen that before, right? It's able to kind of see this is a orange ping pong ball and a Hello Kitty figurine. Very, very precise about the uh, the branding of that one. And obviously it has the large language model, some sort of a large language model built in, which is kind of what we've been seeing from figure one, from some of the Google DeepMind robotic tech. We're beginning to see vision models, language models being combined with, Google DeepMind refers to it as action model. So VLA, vision language action model. But the point is we're seeing massive progress in this field at that kind of intersection of computer vision, large language models, and some sort of an action model, something that allows it to interact with the world. And we're seeing this kind of knowledge diffuse across the industry now, across the world, right? We'll see a certain discovery at one company, and then some engineers from that company will find themselves to this different startup. And all of a sudden they have something that's very exciting and they have a similar tech that we see it on the other side of the world. But the point of this is that this isn't a hidden secret technology. This thing will spread like wildfire. And again, if the story of this company is to be believed, they went from a gleam in their eye, an idea in December 2022 to developing the robot in one year and potentially launching it this year. I mean, that's an incredible rate of development. This little thing where it flips, whatever that is, toast, I guess. Um, the only time I've personally seen something similar to that is with teleoperation, where it was cooking, but there was somebody that was guiding its actions. Maybe it was doing some sort of a playback, but it wasn't, it wasn't skill at the robot kind of generalized that it acquired it wasn't a general capability it was more like 
mimicry of sorts. But yeah, very soon you'll be able to come home at the end of the day and this thing will pop you open a cold one and then potentially even open a bottle of wine for you, pour it into, what is that, a decanter, I believe it's called. I mean, this is pretty cool, I gotta say. Swirl it around. This is gonna bring some difficult decisions to a lot of people because on one hand, a lot of people are kind of scared of robots. On the other, it can aerate the wine for you and pour it into a glass. Just about an hour ago, I asked the people on this channel, I asked all of you, kind of give you a survey, if you had a robot that can only do one thing, would you prefer it just did all the dishes for you or it did all the laundry for you? If, you? if you had to pick one, which chore would you completely want to get rid of in your life? Here's the answer. So far, it's tied. Kind of blown away. I mean, to me, assuming that laundry involves, you know, putting the clothes away, like organizing the clothes, picking the, the socks up off the floor, I mean, assume we're comparing one to one, right? So if it picks up the dishes, washes them and stacks them, then assume the same thing for laundry, picks up the clothes, washes it and puts it away, folded. I would definitely go with the laundry, but I'm surprised it's 50-50 so far. One really interesting robot demo that we saw within the last year, and I forget which exact company it was, but when one of the engineers set up a demo, so it was at his house where he had a humanoid robot. And at the end of the day, the robot, you know, goes next to an outlet, an electrical outlet. And I think it pulls out a cord and legs itself in to the electrical outlet. And something about that was so fascinating to me because it worked all day watering the plants, putting away the dishes, ironing clothes. And then at the end of the day, as the engineer is going to sleep, it actually tucked them in. You see it tucking the engineer in. I mean, some of that must have been pre-scripted somehow. I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't 100% capable of doing all of that on its own, but it was a cool demo. And then it goes next to an electrical socket and plugs itself in for the night so it can rest and recharge and be ready to work the next day. That's kind of cool, I gotta say. So here, it's they're saying still no tele-operation, so it looks like it's looking at the human and, and mimicking the movements fairly, I gotta say, fairly precisely and almost in tandem. I mean, you know, again, assuming this is a one-to-one -one demo and there's no trickery going on, that is pretty cool. Also, the ability to paint the precision of that, so it looks like it's using one of its hand as a paperweight. It's just clamps it on there or just drops it on top of the paper. And they're saying, what else can S1 do for you? So I got to say, I'm excited, not just for this necessarily for the specific product, nothing on this channel so far has been affiliated or paid for by somebody sponsored. That's the word. So I don't care in particular for any of these products, but I'm excited where the field is moving as, as a whole. If I forgot to mention, so this product is out of China and we've seen a number of really interesting robotic startups out of China recently that seemingly are capable of producing fairly inexpensive robots. So while I think companies like Figure One, they're talking about more commercial robots, so warehouses, production facilities, manufacturing, etc. And of course, a lot of this conversation is about robots that are potentially going to be in your house helping you out within the year, potentially, right? I mean, kind of the backdrop to this is the conversation about AI safety. So as I'm sort of getting ready to record this video, Helen Toner, out of all people, posts a TED talk, or I guess it's TED talk that posts it by Helen Toner, talking about how to govern AI. This is, of course, Helen Toner. So if you remember the whole OpenAI fiasco, the board members that, I mean, we still don't know 100% what happened. It seemed like they tried to take over OpenAI to fire Sam, and there was a whole bunch of stuff that, that followed in those events. Well, the person that kind of sounds like kickstarted this whole process was Helen Toner, who is backed by EA, Effective Altruism Movement. And so she's saying how she used to work on AI safety in San Francisco, and now she's off working on AI safety in Washington, D.C. So she went from the startups to now working with, with the government on this policy. Now, we're not going down that whole rabbit hole, but there were one or two other AI news stories that are somewhat related to this. One of them I already covered in a previous video where basically the U.S. Air Force is already, has already been using AI to fly these fighter jets autonomously. The first time I encountered this story, someone on Twitter posted it with the headline, F-16s flown by AI are engaging in dogfights over Area 51. And I was like, wow, that's a great headline. It can't, there's no chance that it's true. I clicked on it. And yeah, no, it's kind of true. It wasn't over Area 51 as far as I can tell. It's more towards a few hours out of LA in California. But yeah, a heavily modified F-16 fighter jet carried out the first ever dogfights with an artificial intelligence flown jet pilot. Now, there was a human pilot in there basically sitting over the, you know, the button like this, the, the emergency button in case something happened. He could take over control and fly himself. But during these testings, at no point did they have to do that. 
the AI pilot that was controlling the jet did everything flawlessly, at least within what they were trying to test for. My understanding was it just kind of replicated some maneuvers that would be required in a dogfight. They weren't actually firing each other, but it was sort of a, a dry run to see how well it could navigate if any issues arose. But something that's kind of related to that story, or maybe not related, but you know how if you live in colder climates, you have to do ice removal sometimes, right? Have you ever thought to yourself, I wish I had an autonomous robot with a attached flamethrower that would be able to do that for me. And also it needs, you know, night vision so that in case they have to do the ice removal at night, it would be able to do so. Of course you have. Take a look. The flamethrowing robot dog capable of shooting fire up to 30 feet. Manufactured by US firm Throw Flame. That's the name of the manufacturer, Throw Flame. And the dog is called the Thermonator. Can inject fuel for up to 45 minutes. It can deliver on demand fire anywhere for a low, low price of 7,600 British pounds. The manufacturer is careful to point out, the manufacturer being Throw Flame, is careful to point out that the Thermonator is not. A weapon, I repeat, it's not a weapon, and instead is strictly to be used for things like wildlife control or perhaps ice removal. Important thing to you keep in mind as you watch this, using it as a weapon will likely violate terms of service and will be frowned upon. It can navigate across different kinds of terrain. It's remotely operated, so, so at least it's not autonomous. That's good. It's not autonomous ice removal. Equipped with light-sensitive mapping and laser sight, the device can also function at night. So if you need to remove ice at night, it can do that. So thanks to AI safety memes for bringing this to my attention, the Therminator, just under 10K US, flamethrowing quadruped robot dog capable of delivering on-demand fire anywhere. Can be used for wildlife control, snow and ice removal, and general entertainment. In those old Italian mobster movies, they often use the term painting houses. When referring to, you know, taking out the competition. Will the future version of that expression be ice removal? I actually kind of want this painting now. In other news, so Adobe has been making some moves in the generative AI field. And they're saying with new generative AI features and the most advanced generative fill yet, it's easier than ever to create stunning lifelike images powered by the new Adobe Firefly Image 3 model. Let's check it out. So it looks like you actually have to install Photoshop beta. I already have Photoshop. This is Photoshop beta. All right, let's take it out for a spin. So in this example, they're showing us a couch. They're saying kind of select this area, including the back of the couch and the seat of the couch. All right, so we'll select that area as such. And we're going to use the generative fill button here. In their example here, the prompt they give us is panda sitting down. All right, why not? Let's try it out. And so it's generating... So that took about five or seven seconds, somewhere in that range. And now there's a panda that's, I mean, it looks like it's taking a nap on a couch, but I'll let it slide. Can we get some pterodactyls in the sky? I'm not sure why I chose such a hard word to spell, but generate. And there's a pterodactyl. So yeah, it takes probably closer to 10 seconds to generate these images, but very, very cool. And how about we have another guest on the couch, generate a fill. How about Abe Lincoln generate? That's not quite what I was thinking, but okay. I'll, I'll give it some points. I don't know what's happening here. Roses? Here on the side, they also have variations that you can use. I feel like none of those quite hit the spot, but that's, that's all right. And the other thing we can do here is just select an area and not specify anything. Just hit generative fill. And we can do a number of things here. One is we can do a reference image. So put an image that we want to make that look like. So insert some specific image into the shot, or we can just leave everything blank and hit generate. And so it gives us a few variations of various flowers or whatnot that we can do. It's also very good at removing objects from the image. As you can see here, Sir Davos, the onion knight is completely gone. And there's a few different things we can replace him with. Here's actually kind of what that looks like in the before and after pretty good. Let's see if we can do outfits. All oh, right, that's not quite what I had in mind, but let's say we get a Lara Croft image and apply it here as a reference image. All right, there it is. Generate. Well, it's still a bit wonky. Not quite what I'm looking for, but they do give you a number of options or different tips to try using feathering, opacity, etc. So 
Part of this will likely be just experimenting with the tools and seeing what works, what doesn't. Also, you can generate images from scratch. How about floating in space, looking at Earth? Let's start with art, and they have a number of different effects you can use. Actually, let's try hyper-realistic, and we'll click generate. That's what it gives us. Here's another take. Here's another take. So I guess let's specify a subject, robot floating in space, looking at Earth. Let's try that. All right, that's pretty good. So I feel like it's not quite at the mid-journey v6 level but it's getting close and i'm sure it's going to keep getting better adobe has to be a little bit more conservative with what kind of images this thing can create you don't want to be upsetting people also they're trying to keep it super safe in terms of copyrighted works rumor is they've been training the adobe firefly on mid-journey images so if it starts looking a little bit more like mid-journey i would not be surprised with that said, all in all, I got to say for a beta, everything here is looking good. The ability to switch things in and out looks pretty good. To add things to it looks pretty good. The reference image ability is still a bit wonky, but I got to say that probably has a lot to do with just putting in the time, learning how to select the correct area. They have several tips in there, like using feathering and opacity, you know, how transparent certain elements are. So I'm sure there's going to be some really good tutorials within the next few months on how to really nail that look. So it looks like Adobe Photoshop is used by over 20 million subscribers. So that's quite a lot of people that are going to be using more and more of this stuff, which is a good thing. More people get exposed to it, more people use, more people use it in their art and presentations. So it's probably a good thing that we're not getting hit with the most advanced, the most photorealistic images possible. Let people come to terms with this first before something that's too indistinguishable from real life. With that said, there's a few really interesting developments in the works that I can't quite talk about yet, but I am excited. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching. Make sure you're subscribed. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.